Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 607. For the 31st of May 2020, Richard Saunders here with you from Sydney, Australia, on the last day of autumn. Well, it officially, in Australia, this is the last day of autumn. Tomorrow is officially the first day of winter. For some reason, Australia works that way. Coming up on this week's show, we're going to be chatting to Abhijit Chanda from New Delhi, India. He's going to be telling us about the COVID-19 situation there in regards to the widespread use of homeopathy. And here in Australia, various websites, uh, namely Homeopathy Plus, have been uh, making much of the fact that India are doing extremely well fighting COVID-19, obviously because they use homeopathy. We'll try to get to the bottom of that with Abhijit. Following that, it's Susan Gerbeck with a report uh, about a sort of a sting operation on yet another person claiming to have mystical psychic powers. This time, the psychic, the so-called psychic, was in New Zealand, and uh, Susan was part of an online uh, session with this psychic. What can we discover about conspiracy theories and COVID-19? Then we have our very own Dr. Pauli with a random rant. Dr. Pauli with a very important announcement about the upcoming Skepticon, the Australian Skeptics National Convention, and how you, no matter where you are around the world, can join in. Then to round off the show, I chat to immunology student Katriona Nguyen-Robinson about some of the more common myths and misunderstandings and misconcepts, lots of myths there, about vaccination. And this interview is with thanks to the Pint of Science organization. Stay tuned at the end of the show for more announcements from me. But now it's time for me to run downstairs and cook up some breadwurst, currywurst, with a uh, bisschen sauerkraut and uh, spargel. Mmm, that all sounds very lecker. While I do that, I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. Joining me now, all the way from New Delhi in India, it's a beautiful place, it's the host of the Rationable podcast, Abhijit Chanda. Hey, hi, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, and uh, Australia isn't doing too bad. All sorts of things are being, um, well, unrestricted, I guess you'd say. Now, I've made contact with you there in India, because uh, you were a guest on our show uh, some weeks ago, when you were telling us about your podcast. Mm -hmm. But I've contacted you today to talk about the ongoing claims that have been made for the ongoing success, apparently, of homeopathy in India. Isn't it wonderful, really? It's just <laughs> so good to hear. And I refer yeah. to the website of Homeopathy Plus here in Australia, mm -hmm. which basically says, wow, India is doing so well. Could it be... Could it be because the government is supplying the population with homeopathic treatment? Now, I note that the official statistics, uh, the day of recording this, mm -hmm. which is the 30th of May, well, according to the Indian government, there are only uh, 4,971 deaths so far due to COVID-19. And I must admit to being, um, well, a little bit skeptical of those numbers? Yeah, so am I. Uh, and there's good reason to be. We don't really know the exact numbers because, well, first of all, we don't know how many people are, I mean, there are, because there are lots of people who are not being tested, first of all, and not a lot of people who are not being hospitalized or mm. and a lot of people whose stories are not being told. I mean, recently, I uh, I read an article on uh, sciencemag.org, which is, you know, for the journal Science, um, they have a story of uh, a recent uh, coronavirus case where a gentleman called Naseem Qureshi, 
He suddenly de- developed a fever, a cough, a shortness of breath. He lives in Mumbai and uh, he tried to get admitted to a hospital and he wasn't allowed. He wasn't allowed in there. And Mumbai is one of the hardest hit cities in the country. And it was one of the first places for the virus to pop up. Well, actually, that was Kerala. But Mumbai and Maharashtra has been one of the top states and cities who have been suffering from the pandemic. Delhi coming in at a close second in many cases. But there are, and we don't, this is one story that came out on the science website. But we don't know how many other people there are out there who have been sick, who may have gotten better, who may have died due to this infection and have just not been reported because they have not been tested, they have not been hospitalized mm. and their numbers just haven't been counted. So we really, and there's no real, no real way to really find out what the real numbers are because, well, the numbers are as they are. It's controlled by the government and we don't really know what they're up to. So there's good reason to be skeptical. Um, yeah. We just don't know what the actual situation is. And even now, like you must have seen the case, cases have gone over 100,000 yes. across the country. And we, I, I, I honestly can't say for sure if that number is accurate, if that is a number that we can trust because because of the migrant situation now and things are starting to lift even as the numbers are rising the uh, lockdowns are lifting people are out on the streets i i went out to the market the other day and it was just like a regular day at the market and on the streets there was traffic there was red lights there was a regular number of people out and about except there were most of them were wearing masks yes yes well. and in this kind of situation it's it's kind of, I mean, I, as much as I love not being locked down as much before, <laughs> it's really, uh, it's kind of scary to see that the numbers are still right, shooting up at higher and higher numbers every day. Yeah, yeah. And more and more restrictions are being lifted. So, yeah, the situation is not good. We just don't know the real numbers and things are going to get worse because the migrant workers who have been trudging home and getting killed on highways for the last couple of months are now going to be reaching home a lot quicker. Some of them might be carrying something. And once it hits rural India, where medical, where the medical infrastructure is almost non-existent, then it'll go out of control. And But then we still won't have the real numbers because who's going to go out in the middle of the villages testing people and taking records of, yeah. of well, a majority of the Indian population? You make a very good point. And uh, it's interesting to see these people here in Australia saying that they find it very encouraging because the Indian government promote the use of homeopathy. But I have to think with the population of India and the size of India, even if the government did have something, anything, that uh, they could get out to the population mm. to fight this virus, how on earth could they go about doing it? Well, they, um, they are trying every way they possibly can. In fact, in Telangana, uh, which is... Um, it's towards the south of India. Uh, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, neighboring states, Hyderabad is smack in the middle. The government in Telangana have been distributing homeopathic doses. Uh, not homeopathic doses, but doses of homeopathy. Yeah. <laughs> there is that <laughs> distinction yeah. there. Um, and have uh, gone out and started distributing them. And I think on the very first day, they distributed 11,500 doses. Mm. To over three and a half thousand people, and that is, of course, a tiny fraction of the number of people in that state. Yeah, yeah. But and there are people who are going to get it as much as they possibly can. I mean, they, I have seen people in my neighborhood shops who go up and are asking for arsenicum album thirty because the Ministry of Ayush has been promoting it. Yep. Uh, so a lot of people, it's 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 both a push and a pull uh, situation. So the There are some states and governments who are distributing it, are promoting it. The Ministry of Ayush is all over the place. I just posted something about them this morning. They're they're promoting left, right and center with absolutely no qualms whatsoever. And so it's a push and a pull. It's not about distributing, really, because we really can't distribute it to the furthest points in our country. But whatever the people, especially in the villages, in the distant villages, can get at their nearest feeder town, 
they will get whatever they can. Yeah. And whether that's hydroxychloroquine, whether that's arsenicum album, whether that's some Ayurvedic preparations like Chawan Prash, which I'm hoping to write about soon. Mm -hmm. It's, they'll pick anything. In fact, even hydroxychloroquine, which Trump has been, you know, talking about a lot, is something that a lot of people in India are taking very seriously. They think it's a perfectly safe medication to take, but we know that the recent, the most recent studies, I think, on the Skeptics Guide, I listened to, I was listening to one of the recent podcasts, and they said there has been a meta-analysis done of quite a large number of patients, and hydroxychloroquine has been found to have absolutely no effect, no positive effect mm. against coronavirus, against COVID-19. Now, Abhijit, I was just looking at this website, uh, this uh, website of the Homeopathy Plus, and they have a page there called uh, A Short History of Homeopathy in India. Mm -hmm. And uh, it says last reviewed on the 25th of May, whatever that means. And it says, during the past 200 years, homeopathy has flourished in India with broad usage and acceptance across all sectors of the population. Homeopathy first reached the Indian subcontinent in 1810 during the founder Hanuman's lifetime and gained an early footing with amateur use by civilians, missionaries, and the military. And it goes on to say, in 1973, the Indian government recognized homeopathy as a national system of medicine and since then has largely funded its training and distribution. Currently, India has over 200,000 registered homeopathic doctors, more than 200 homeopathic medical colleges, research and postgraduate institutes, and numerous dispensaries. Now, it sounds to me that homeopathy is really and completely entrenched in Indian society. It is. In fact, I mean, considering that it came to India so soon after its invention, it was really something new, it was modern, it was the new iPhone, <laughs> if you could call it that. Um, but, <laughs> the, uh, but, there, but we've had like some of our greatest freedom, freedom fighters, uh, Rabindranath Tagore, who is basically who's got his picture up in almost every Bengali household, including mine. Yeah, who is a who is a great literary figure, and f prominent people in India who are who are freedom fighters, who are politicians, who are you know prominent uh, personalities. They have all they were all you know shouting the praises of homeopathy from the rooftops. Sort of wow, thing. and so. It's become and it's become a part of our culture now because it's been around for so long that people equate it with Ayurveda, as I've mentioned before. For some reason, I can't figure out how they manage to, you know, tie those things together, what string they use. But it is deeply entrenched in the culture of India. It is a part of our. It is it's things that we have taken for granted because as children. We are just brought up with it. We are given homeopathic medication as kids hmm. and Ayurvedic medicines. I was I was forced to have Chavan Prash when I was a kid just to, you know, do whatever it does, <laughs> which I, I'm not really sure what it does <laughs> yeah. exactly. But I will, I, I am investigating that currently. But yeah, so it's... Um, it's been so entrenched in our culture that, and we have so taken it for granted that people don't even think twice about it. Like I was, I was on uh, the Skeptoid uh, podcast, you know, on the thirteenth podcast marathon. Um, podcast marathon. Mm, yes, that was good fun. Yes, me too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we were both on there, and during my half an hour with Brian, I did mention that, especially. I mean, it's not just in India, but especially in India where things like homeopathy have become a part of our everyday lives, where we've taken it for granted, it is almost like a religious belief because mm. we are literally indoctrinated it, into it from the time we were children. Yeah, We were brought into it. Our parents have taken it for granted. They said, if you have this, then you take that preparation. If you have this, then I'll give you this pill. I have taken it, like, I have, I have taken homeopathy for a lot of my life. And without questioning it whatsoever. And most people don't. So which is why I think it's very important for people 
to speak up about it now. There are a lot of doctors, there are a lot of scientists, skeptical thinkers, people who I've encountered very recently who are trying to spread awareness about the truth behind homeopathy and how it's complete quackery. There's a lot of pushback, but I'm glad that that push is happening. It's it's about damn time we did. I couldn't agree more, Abhijit. I couldn't agree more. Now, before we go, how are you going with the Be Rationable podcast? Well, things have been... Um, I have recently uh, published an article and a podcast episode on immunity boosting. Mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately, it was it took quite a gap because my day job, unfortunately, takes a lot of uh, a lot of my time. But God, I have to pay the bills, right? So, um, yeah. but it's but whether it's a long period between episodes or a short one, either way, it's going strong. I am managing to get in touch with people, you know, uh, really wonderful people who I've been getting in touch with over the last few weeks, uh, who are also Indians who are passionate about this topic, who are trying to talk sense into the populace about quackery and alternate, alternative medicine. And uh, hopefully I'm getting to start a few interesting conversations here and there. So lots more coming soon. Thank you very much for having me on. I just, I greatly appreciate it. And um, everybody, to everybody listening, please come to the berationable.com or listen to the Rationable podcast wherever you get it and uh, join in the conversation. So there you are, folks. There's the clue for you all. Have a listen to Be Rationable. Well, Abhijit, all the way from uh, beautiful New Delhi in India. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure, Richard. Until next time. G'day, this is Dr. Carl, Carl Krasinski, proud to be a skeptic, and you can find out more about me at drcarl.com and get lots of free stuff there as well. We need to think. Here's Susan Gerbic. And joining me now on the line, all the way from beautiful Salinas, California, once again, and it's about time, it's Susan Gerbic. Hello. Hi, Richard. Hi, listeners. Nice to see you once again. Uh, now, mm-hmm. I was all ready to put the show to bed. I thought, great, the show's all done this week. But no, late last night, an emergency message from Susan Gerbeck came my way about another sting operation with a suitably crazy name. What's the name of this operation? <laughs> <laughs> this is Operation Purple Pinecone Pie, better known as OPPP. Hang on, Operation Purple Pie? Pinecone pie. Yes. O P P P. Well, now this revolves around a so called, and I always try to use that term, a so called psychic. This one is in New Zealand. She goes by the name mm-hmm. of Jeanette Wilson. It's probably her real name. Now, I have. Uh, I haven't exactly dealt with Jeanette Wilson in the past, but she certainly has come to my attention. Many years ago, when I visited New Zealand, the local skeptics there. Or if I remember correctly, even maybe one of the TV stations gave me some raw tape and footage of Jeanette Wilson doing a live psychic stage show act routine, which is right out of the book, the same sort of stock stuff we've seen for years and years and years, nothing special there. But apparently she's sort of, well, moved on a bit. Yes, now she is more into the healing part of Mm. the mediumship she still um, can sense dead people she says and communicate with them but she's teaching people how to um, communicate with their dead and I attended one of her uh, zoom meetings a couple days ago so what happened was uh, one of the uh, board members from the New Zealand skeptics Russell he had said that he had been getting um, emails from Jeanette Wilson 
from time to time because he had attended one of her healing events as an observer, of course, for the New Zealand skeptics. And they were able to write about it. Right. And um, she now has a Wikipedia page and a lot of great information's on it. But anyway, so Russell had asked, you know, it'd be really interesting if we went to one of her events. There's one later tomorrow. And I said, well, let's do it. We thought she was going to be speaking to the dead because that was the kind of thing she used to do. Right. And so we prepared characters from Facebook. And, um, you know, of course, we have a stock of characters that we can, you know, depending on who's going to go see the medium, we would fit a character to go with that person. So we bought tickets to go. It was a 10 person event and we had several tickets we purchased to go and sit in on her event on a Facebook live it was a private group, but we were able to uh, record. And we also, at the end of it, we were we went into an, uh, a Zoom call. So all of us were able to see each other and we were able to interact with her and see each other. Now, unfortunately for me, I'm in California and this took place at 8 p.m. New Zealand time, which was 1 a.m. for me. Oh, wow. So I had to sit through about two and a half hours of her meditating and um, so on. She didn't speak to the dead. What she was doing was she was teaching people how to, how to get in the right mindset so we could contact our own dead family members. Oh, wow. That's, that's pretty dramatic. But from what I understand that uh, these days, if she doesn't so much do the simple, pure talking to the dead uh, routine, she seems to have moved more into giving health advice and, Health advice around COVID-19. What were some of the things that she was uh, telling the group? Right. So we have recorded all of this, but what I'm going to do is read a little bit off the transcripts. And this is quite surprising. About um, two hours, 15 minutes into it, we met in a Zoom room with uh, all, all the other participants in the call. And she kind of asked everybody, so how was that for everybody? Did you guys have a good time? You know, and, and so I asked a question and what I had asked her was if, you know, I said, I'm from America and we have had over a hundred thousand deaths from COVID-19. And I was wondering what she foresaw for um, COVID-19 and, you know, a potential vaccination mm -hmm. vaccines, because the word is, is that uh, Jeanette is uh, anti-vax and anti 5G, and she sells, um, like she's involved somehow in a company that's selling some um, supplements or some products. Mm. And I know that she has been saying she's not anti vaccine. And so I wanted to see if we could get on the record from her, from her mouth, mm -hmm. <laughs> directly from her, right. what her thoughts were on vaccines. So that's why I asked the question the way I, I did. And I was in character, so I didn't challenge her too much, uh, but somewhat. So so according to the transcripts from um, the video we have, some of the things she was telling me were that th this was a much bigger thing that was going to happen. And the deaths we've had right now were supposed to be so much bigger. And now they're um, it's going to go away really soon. And that she says she believes that God created this body and God created this body with a an immune system. So she's not a believer in vaccines. She says, I'm not anti-vax, but I'm really good. I'm really pro good science, really good science. And vaccines is something I've studied now for about 20 years. So I'm quite knowledgeable about vaccines and what's required isn't a vaccine. Well, well that, that, let me stop you. That, that, that's, that's very interesting because that just sounds like the typical rhetoric of an anti-vaxxer. First of all, saying they're not anti-vax. That's a big red flag. If someone walks around saying, I'm not really anti-vax, well, that's a dead giveaway that they really are uh, anti-vax. <laughs> and then she says she's really pro good science, really good science. In other words, she's pro the science that cons, uh, conforms with her conspiracy theories, I, I would dare say. And that's sort of backed up by the fact that she's saying that something much worse was going to happen, but it was thwarted. It means that she's thinking there's people pulling strings behind the scenes with this virus, I would dare say. Right. And she, she doesn't have any experience. I mean, maybe she has been reading and talking about vaccines for 20 years. That's possible. She, she's a bake manager. I mean, she doesn't have any degrees in science or virology or anything of that kind. Or if she does, she doesn't talk about it. I mean, I, I just thought that was really odd that she thought she was an expert on vaccines and she was able to talk about it. 
in that way. Um, she says that it's um, going to take about two years to develop a vaccine, but she says that the, the disease has already mutated over 30 times. So if we were to create a vaccine now for the version of the vac- uh, of the virus we're seeing now, it won't be useful because it will have already mutated so much that we won't be able to use a vaccine created today on the virus that we'll see in uh, 18 months to two years. Oh, well, I mean, it's hard to really nail that one down. It depends on what happens with the virus and where it goes. But I, from what I understand, because I've had a quick look at some of the transcripts myself, she is under the impression that this virus will miraculously disappear in mm-hmm. the next few months. It'll, be, it'll vanish without mm-hmm. vaccines. Absolutely. She says that it, she does believe that it is man-made. Uh, what she says is that it was released through by accident. It wasn't intentionally released, but people shouldn't have been doing that research anyway. It's banned. There's an international law that banned it back in 1934. I think it was 34 or, th- or 43. Um, there it was like a worldwide moratorium on germ-, germ warfare. And somebody was doing some germ warfare. And that's going to unfold over the next little while. So apparently we're going to learn a lot bit more. Now, apparently, uh, it turns out that she's a big supporter of uh, one Donald Trump, president of the United States. Yes, that was quite hard for me to stay in character when she revealed that. Um, (laughs) What she said, and I quote, but some people like me for this and some people don't. If you told me 12 months ago I would like Donald Trump, I'd have said not in a million years. The man's an idiot. I made so many jokes about him. He's now my hero. He's one very, very smart man, and he's doing a hell of a lot behind the scenes. He's seen through Dr. Anthony Fauci. He sorted out the World Health Organization. He's stopping the 5G. He's stopping mandatory vaccines. All the key things that need to happen. He's onto it a lot more than most people realize. (laughs) So some of the other things she was talking about was that there's going to be a lot that's going to be revealed in time. And she had a lot of uh, conspiracy theories about that the world is being controlled by, she says, 300 people basically are in charge of the world. And these people are going to be exposed and their nefarious doings of being exposed as well. It's going to be nice, but it's going to be for the ultimate good. And she's going to have all, she says, it's all going to be revealed soon. So it seems to me like a shopping list there of uh, stock standard conspiracy theories, one world government, Mm -hmm. the Illuminati, people behind the scenes. Uh, it sounds mm-hmm. like she's been diving down the rabbit hole. Oh, big time. She, she, I don't think they make ladders long enough to get her out of this one. <laughs> she said that the disease is going to basically just go away. Now, I'm questioning her. I just, I would ask a question and then I'd remain silent. And she just kept filling the space. Our exchange went on for thir- 16 minutes long. And I, well, you have to remember, it was about 3.15 in the morning for me. I was really punchy and I was really tired. So I ca- I did ask her, you know, where is this disease going to go? Because she said it was just going to go away. And she says, she said to me, the nature of the virus, the nature of the virus is that it wants to live. Yeah, we already got 30 mutations. If the host dies, the virus doesn't want to live and go on. So the virus is already mutated. What's happening in the States is a lot of your deaths are being reported as COVID deaths, even if they're not. Okay, again, this is typical conspiratorial thinking. Absolutely out of the box, out of the book, reading off the script, conspiracy theories. Right, but she has some good suggestions of how we can... can, we can save some lives. Oh, what's that? Right. She says, in the meantime, it's about bolstering the immune system. Mm. And there's a really good product if you're worried about yourself or somebody within the family. It's a product called HFI, and it's produced in America, and it's from a company called Inzacta. Mm. And snarky me, I had to ask her to spell it because I wanted to make sure I had that down. And she said, E-N-Z-A-C-T-A, and she would be happy to... um, facilitate me receiving this if I wanted to because she has connections. She says that the virus attaches to your lungs. So this product, what it does is it lines the lungs, making it resistant to something attaching to it. And it's the best preventive that she can recommend. And she brings it in from America to New Zealand. Okay, so this is some sort of supplement or whatever she thinks is the best uh, thing you can take to help uh, 
prevent COVID-19. It's amazing that the whole world isn't using this uh, product. Right. I asked her about that. I said, I, I, I've never heard of it. Why aren't we talking about it here? And again, I, I reiterated that we have over 100,000 people who have died in the United States. Why do we not know about this? And she just shrugged her shoulders and said, she's like, well, it'll become clear eventually. All right. So it seems to me to sort of sum this all up, uh, it's somebody who claims that they have psychic powers who can speak to the dead now uh, fancies themselves to be more of a healer. But basically, when you Mm -hmm. get down to it, appears to be anti-vax, anti-5G and into conspiracy theories like the one world government and the virus was man-made. Do you think that's a fair summing up? I think that's a pretty fair summing up. I think I would add, though, that I got on her got on the record what date line we're talking about, you know, what timeline, because, again, Mm -hmm. I wanted to make I knew I was recording and I knew I wanted to get on on video what time she said. And I said, is this going to take about 18 months? And she said, no, it'll be by the end of the year. And I said, oh, and then we'll have a our second wave. She says, no, there will be no second wave. It's going to quote, unquote, and she used her little finger quotes, um, all go away uh, miraculously. And that, you know, we'll know soon because it'll all be gone by the end of the year and it's not coming back. Wow. That, they're pretty, they're Sounds pretty... familiar. Sounds like some Donald J. Trump talking there. <laughs> but it, they're, they're uh, remarkable claims. Now that uh, you've got this and you have a transcript mm-hmm. of uh, some of the more well, far-fetched or interesting or possibly health-related claims there. Uh, What's the next step, apart from appearing on the Skeptic Zone? Right. So I'm releasing it to uh, the story to the Skeptic Zone first. So you have first shot at it. And I have also notified everybody I can think of in New Zealand as far as um, the media. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to get the New Zealand authorities involved because obviously I don't think this is something that's okay. She has followers that are hanging on to her advice and they may um, take this supplement thinking they're, you know, they're going to keep COVID away. And it's not so much New Zealanders I'm worried about because the the rate over there is very low. But in America, I mean, it, it's really awful. And she has fans and supporters here in America. And this is very dangerous things for people to be, um, somebody who's, I mean, this isn't Joe down the street. This is a, a person who has some sort of authority in the community of, well, psychics or whatever. And I think that she's not being challenged. Nobody on the call challenged her. Nobody said a word. It was just me talking to her back and forth for 16 minutes. And I thought to myself, these people who are listening in probably would take this supplement. Well, you make a very good point there, Susan. Uh, it's not just New Zealand. Once she gets on the camera there on the internet and she broadcasts or gets clients from around the world, it becomes a very interesting international situation. But I think the people in New Zealand should be taking a very close look at some of these claims, right. especially where it relates to health and 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 bizarre, silly statements like uh, uh, a lot of the deaths being reported aren't actually deaths from COVID after all. I mean, this is just uh, wacky conspiracy theories. But thank you for mm-hmm. staying up so late into the night to uh, <laughs> to sit through all this, Susan. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank the New Zealand skeptics for um, inviting me to uh, look into this and to facilitate me um, uh, being on the call with me and being being with me. It was a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun chatting in the side. And if people want to join the Gorilla Skeptics and more opportunities like this, please let me know. I'm always doing something. Well, let's keep an eye on the situation. But for now, Susan, go back all the way over there in beautiful Salinas, California. Thank you once again. Thank you so much, Richard. Skeptic Magazine, the journal from Australian skeptics. Subscribe online to the world's second oldest skeptical magazine. Visit www.skeptics.com.au and click the publications link. You can also find there over 30 years of back issues free to download. The Skeptic, a magazine from Australian skeptics.
Let's have a random rant with Dr. Pauly. Well, folks, joining me now all the way from the beautiful Gold Coast is our very own Dr. Pauly with an important update to this year's Skepticon. Pauly, hello. Hi, how are you, Richard? I'm doing very well. And just in the last uh, last day, in fact, some very important information has come from the Gold Coast regarding this year's Skepticon. What's the news? What's the deal? Yes, so um, we have been waiting to see how things are going to play out um, with, with obviously COVID-19 um, and whether or not we run a face-to-face or online or mixed conference. Um, and we put out a survey and, uh, you know, asked the sceptical community what they thought. Mm. Um, we had a really overwhelming positive and supportive um, response. So uh, thank you to everyone who completed the very short survey. The vast majority of people were in leaning towards online or a mixed approach and most of those people that had put down that they would be happy to come either face to face or online in the mixed approach stipulated that only if it was safe to do so given that things are looking good here but restrictions are easing we don't know whether or not in october we're going to have a second wave i sincerely hope not yeah But uh, unfortunately, you know, my chakras are not aligned. uh, (laughs) So my um, psychic abilities are shot at the moment. So um, we thought that the best option would be to cut our losses and go for an online conference this year. Some might even say it's unprecedented for the (laughs) Australian (laughs) sceptics to do so. It will be a a first. Yeah. Um, And I'm really excited um, to to be able to uh, offer that to not just me but the whole team to offer that to to our sceptical community. Hopefully those that might not have been able to make it all the way up to the Gold Coast this year or um, live in especially those in rural and remote areas and even overseas, uh, we'll be able to chime in. And the plan is to keep the costs as low as possible. The only thing that the cost will be covering, hopefully, will be our cancellation fees oh, for no. all the wonderful venues we had booked because oh, we no. were too organised. Um, we booked everything yeah. and then about a month later, uh, it hit Australia and we went into lockdown. So... <laughs> <laughs> the price you pay for being too organised. Oh, dear um, me. Well, yes, well, we yeah. should have been listening to all those psychics who warned us of the, <laughs> the pandemic. But, 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 but be that as it may, I think now for the rest of the world and all the people listening to the podcast in all the different countries around the world, this is your opportunity now to be part of the Australian Skeptics National Convention. And I think that's very exciting. Yeah, I agree. I'm... Um, You know, there's always a silver lining to all things. One of the amazing things that has come out from even our Gold Coast skeptics moving to online, sort of our our pub meets are now online. They're no longer skeptics in the pub, they're skeptics on the couch. (laughs) Has been able to, you know, do it online. And, And so we're getting people tuning in from all over Australia and people that normally want to come but can't make it because of distance um, or timing, kids, all that sort of thing. So that accessibility is a real plus. And we will be trying to uh, come up with some ways that we can still create that feeling of community during Skepticon, which is really one of the big pluses of coming to a Skepticon. And the other thing that we'd like to say is this is a national conference. So if there are people out there that are tech savvy or have run web conferences before, please contact us. Uh, Email me at gcskeptics at gmail.com. That's gcskeptics at Mm gmail.com. And just let us know if you're able to help out and what your experience is because we're flying by the seat of our pants (laughs) at the moment and 
but we 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 need some experienced people to try and help us out so we can really deliver something amazing. Well, if there's one thing I know about the worldwide skeptical community and and listeners to this podcast is they are so willing and able to help and they love to help so there is the message folks if you think you can help out with a few technical tips if you've run something like this before an online convention uh, please get in contact with dr Pauli and the gold coast skeptics now dr Pauli, where can people go to find out more information at the moment yep so we're making all our announcements on skepticon.org.au mm-hmm. so all our all the announcements news uh program all that sort of thing will be posted on there um and we do share these to our twitter and uh facebook accounts but the best is to go to skepticon.org.au that's what we'll do folks we'll have a look at there and once again uh, dr Pauli, i think by and large, I think you've made a very uh, wise decision because better safe than sorry. But again, mm. let's look at the, the bright side and the chance for people all around the world to uh, to be sitting in the audience, so to speak, on their own couch while listening to some of the great talks at an Australian Skeptics Convention and the Bent Spoon and all that sort of fun stuff. Yeah, and hey, look, you don't even need to put your pants on this year to come to Skepticon. So. <laughs> oh, I, never, I never wear my pants at a Skepticon. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, there's an upside to everything. So, you can do it all in the comfort of your own home. So, yeah. there certainly <laughs> is. All right. Well, there's the news, folks. Once again, Dr. Pauli, all the way there uh, on the Gold Coast. Thank you very much. Thanks, Richard. Australian skeptics in the pub online. A talk by Dr. Stefan Nicolin. From pharmaceuticals to electrocuticals, how zapping the brain can treat depression. Now, this will be on Thursday, the 4th of June at 7 p.m. Sydney time. Stefan Nicolin has a PhD, 2019, in neuromodulation and electrophysiology and is an early career researcher based at the University of New South Wales and the Black Dog Institute. As a nationally recognized expert on the use of transcranial magnetic stimulation for depression, he has traveled and provided on-site training to 21 public hospitals and private clinics in four Australian states and territories and credentialed approximately 200 nurses and psychiatrists on the safe and effective delivery of transcranial magnetic stimulation. This promises to be a fascinating talk, all online. And for more information and how you can join in, see the links in this week's show notes or visit Australian Skeptics on Meetup. Now, folks... We, uh, we are a bit disappointed lately because of all the things being shut down and uh, we can't attend things. One of those things was the wonderful Pint of Science. And Pint of Science is uh, an annual event where science communicators get together, have a nice pint of beer or a drink of their choice and chat to people generally in a pub. And even this year, I was asked to be a part of Pine and Science, which I was looking forward to. Well, the uh, pandemic had other plans. But the Pint of Science people have put me in touch with somebody who really taps into something the Skeptic Zone and the Australian Skeptics have been very interested and uh, working on for many years, which is vaccination and maybe more importantly, vaccination myths. Joining me all the way from Melbourne, we have Katriona Nguyen Robinson from the Godfrey Laboratory, University of Melbourne Department of Microbiology and Immunology. What a mouthful. <laughs> it's a pretty long name. <laughs> <laughs> and please tell me uh, and our listeners just a little bit about yourself and what you do there. So I'm an immunology student. I'm studying our immune response to different bacteria and in terms of infection, especially the bacteria that causes tuberculosis. And I'm also looking a little bit at skin allergy as well. So how our immune system recognizes different things that cause allergy and how we can stop them from doing that. 
And uh, I guess part of your remit or part of the things you, you would like to do since uh, you were involved in Pint of Science in one way or the other is to let people know, let the public know what you're doing. Yeah, pretty much. Because a lot of what I do is is sort of what we call basic biology or basic science in that it's sort of baby steps towards creating something that will eventually translate into something in the clinic. And I think it's important that people know that, you know, even that science is important too. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I mean, from our point of view, of course, all science is very important. Now, and I was just chatting to you a second ago, because as we record, as we record uh, this interview, the news headline has come, which says federal ministers flooded with unprecedented level of anti-vaccination mail. Vaccination opponents have flooded senior government ministers with an unprecedented levels of uh, correspondence as experts warn of new wave of skeptics anxious about potential coronavirus vaccine. Now, this is a worry for us because the anti-vaxxers have, have used, gazumptus have used our name skeptics, and we're really not very happy about that. We keep pleading with the media to call these people vaccination deniers, not vaccination skeptics. Be that as it may, one of your interests, of course, is the myths and the misunderstanding and the misconceptions revolving around vaccination. Have you had much to to do with the 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 hardcore anti vaccinationists. Well, with the hardcore ones, I try and avoid having <laughs> heated conversations. Um, you know, very wise, very wise. Yeah, so I, I do try and um, educate people, I guess, about the immune system and what it does and the point about vaccines. But I try and steer clear of anything too heated and passionate, I guess. <laughs> Well, look, that I, I can understand that completely because it can be very hard indeed. And people get very passionate. You're absolutely right. But let's look at some of the, well, the, the more, what, what can I say, the standard list of myths and misconceptions out there. Now, here's an interesting one. Vaccination is unnatural. Yeah, you kind of come across that with, with people saying, you know, this is basically just injecting yourself with science and and it's it's really not a normal way to go about fighting a disease but but really vaccines use a person's natural immune defenses to respond to disease so the idea is to give you a small dose of the bacteria or a virus that they're sort of disarmed in a way so they're not able to cause a full-blown infection but it it's allowing your immune system to have the chance to remember it and build up an army to rapidly defend itself the next time that bacteria or virus tries to infect you and actually going back you know thousands of years for the people who kind of like to think more about natural medicine the brahmins in india so the the medical medical practitioners in india a long time ago they would just be scratching people and putting scabs infected scabs mm. on the scratches so that's something that i guess you could kind of think of as natural medicine that is really sort of the baby steps towards what we think of vaccination today yeah and and, and i like the the term you use the the the, the viruses are disarmed that's, <laughs> that's that's a lovely analogy i really like that and uh, the, well, I mean, probably the biggest myth or misunderstanding that we face, certainly from the anti-vaccination crowd, is the blanket statement, vaccinations are unsafe. Now, from your point of view, how would you counter that one? Well, I think it's important to clarify that, that vaccines are tested for how well they work and how safe they are. So with any given drug treatment vaccine that comes out of a laboratory and before it reaches the clinic or, or hospital, it's tested on several people and then more and more and more escalating to make sure that it's safe in all of those people before it even reaches market. Vaccines like any other any other pharmacological product that, that comes out of Australia, it has to pass stringent testing for safety by the Therapeutics Goods Association or the TGA. And they're sampled, they're regular, regularly monitored, so it's not just when it comes out. Like even several months or years down the track, they're always testing that they're safe and effective. And I mean, sometimes they might produce 
undesired effects. Like you might have a sore arm, but that's actually a sign that your immune system is kicking in. Oh, right, yeah. The idea is to generate inflammation, which is why you have a sore arm around the area that you've been vaccinated. There's an old saying in in sceptical circles, and you've probably come across um, homeopathy in your travels, because another thing we've been fighting is is homeopathy, because there are groups out there who say you can give your, your baby homeopathic vaccines, and it has no side effects. Well, of course, the comeback is, well, if something has no side effects, it has no effects to begin with, because it's just the way the body works. But uh, but getting back to these, you know, being unsafe, another thing we hear all the times is, and you see placards, people walking with these, vac- vaccinations contain toxins, additives, foreign proteins, and or metals. Now, what's the story there? Well, all vaccines vary in their composition. The idea is that you are giving, as I said, a disarmed bacteria mm. or virus, but it's not just that. Um, it, it could be parts of them, it could be whole, but you do need additives and things like that to to keep it safe because once produced, the vaccines are sitting around in warehouses for a very long time right? And before they're actually used. So they, they do require additives to help stabilise them, but those additives themselves are also checked out by the Therapeutics Goods Association, so they're checked as well. Um And I guess another thing that people can be concerned about in terms of the things that are added into vaccines, um, for for example, with the flu vaccine, if you are allergic to eggs or chicken, they do advise that, you know, you you take that into consideration because viruses can't grow outside of cells. So when we're producing viruses in a lab, we do have to grow them in cells. um, And some virus vaccines are made in chicken eggs or cells in Mm. a lab. So just like a bar of nut-free chocolate might write, may contain traces of nuts. Some vaccines may also contain traces of substances like egg. Yeah, that's an interesting point. You know, it never crossed my mind that vaccines have to sit somewhere being stored, waiting for use. And of course, you know, they can perish and they need to be maintained. That's a very good point. Uh, I'm saying it's just like the pickles that you eat. The pickles need to be preserved. (laughs) So the vaccines need to be preserved too, but you need pickles that's a good point now one of the most emotive ones you know the, the really that uh, stirs people is the uh, the slogan that uh, vaccines are produced using aborted fetuses that's a rather heavy one mm. um there, there has been concern about the morality of receiving vaccines when the virus is grown using fetal tissue so viruses do have to be grown in cells Um, and that's for long periods of time. So some cells that are used in the lab did originate from human fetal tissue, and that was obtained from a couple of elected elective abortions in the 1960s. That's quite some time ago, but those abortions weren't done for the purpose of harvesting cells, and no further fetal tissue has been taken since, since that time. And while there might be objections on the basis of religion, the Vatican did issue a statement a while ago saying that those kind of moral problems are negated if the otherwise danger to our health is outweighing that. Yeah, it's always the balancing act, isn't it? I mean, this, this, it's a very interesting f- philosophical avenue we could explore, explore on. A rabbit hole, in other words. And most cells that, that we do use in a lab are actually sort of cancer cells as opposed to mm. fetal cells anyway. So we use eggs, chicken eggs, or we use um, cancer cells as opposed to anything wow. from aborted tissue. <laughs> okay. Now, here's, here's an interesting one. People who are vaccinated can still get the disease. Uh, and another one is the flu shot will give you the flu. But it's true. I mean, people who are vaccinated can still get uh, the disease. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Vaccines aren't 100% effective and some people might be vaccinated and not generate a great immune response and that's just sort of individual specific. So, for example, I myself, I was vaccinated for hepatitis B when Mm. I was little and they tested um, a couple of years ago, whether or not I was protected, and I, I wasn't, so I needed to be vaccinated again. Um, 
So some people, for whatever underlying genetic reason or something like that, they just can't develop a strong immune response even if they do have a vaccination. But having said that, just because you might not have a good immune response to one infection doesn't mean that you're not protected against the other. Mm. Um, I guess the flu is a very good example in that you do need the annual flu shot and even if you do get it, that doesn't guarantee that you don't get the flu and that's just because the influenza virus itself is um, very varied. Right. So even though you might be protected against some strains of flu, there are others that your immune system hasn't encountered before even with the vaccine. So you might be infected with those ones that slip through the cracks. And it's interesting what you say because, again, we're getting back to what the anti-vaxxers say. They'll march around saying um, it's not 100% safe and effective. Well, it, no one ever, as you said, nobody ever says it was because nothing is 100% um, um, safe and effective. But it's the sort of thing they'll they'll use to say, you know, any bad reactions. You say, well, it obviously doesn't work. Look at this, you know, you've got the sore arm. Or, or they, they will trumpet the fact that, and we can get on to the next myth. They will trumpet the fact that vaccines cause autism or in, and or inflammatory bowel diseases and all sorts of awful things. Yeah, well, that, that theory or the link between vaccines and autism or inflammatory bowel disease, that was posed by a group of researchers in I think, 1998 or something like that. It was last century. <laughs> um, That's a good way to put it, yes. <laughs> But that paper that was published that actually claimed that has since been retracted mm. as the, the data and the theory was sort of based on fraudulent kind of research. And there, there have been so many more studies lately that, or more recently, that show that there is no link between vaccines and autism or these other kind of diseases. Now, you are involved in such interesting and important work. And, of course, if you ever want to pick the brains of the uh, uh, Australian skeptics, and we've got a lot of people who have been fighting these myths for many years. You know, you know where to find us now. So that's really great. And uh, we, of course, are always at your disposal uh, if you want to find uh, more information or pick our brains. But uh, wow, what a what a treat it is to to chat to someone of a like mind, someone interested in in the importance of uh, vaccination and immunization, especially in our current environment with the um, the pandemic. And you've probably seen this yourself. There are people already geared up to oppose and fight any vaccination that comes along for COVID-19. We do live in a crazy world. Yeah, I, I really can't believe how fast these conspiracy theories around COVID-19 have been spreading. It's basically been paralleled to the amount of information we've been learning about them as well. I guess the more we learn, the more conspiracy theories are popping up. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I don't think we've seen anything yet. <laughs> we live in interesting times. Well, listen, uh, Catriona, thank you so much for sparing some time. A fascinating uh, dive into some of the myths of vaccination. Uh, but for now, once again, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone and thank you to those people who continue to support The Skeptic Zone at Patreon or PayPal. Just go to www.skepticzone.tv and click the link near the top that says Patreon or PayPal and then you'll be given instructions what to do. Or if you just want to use PayPal directly, the PayPal is paypal.me slash saunderstv. But anyway, anything you can... Um, you can um, Russell up to help the Skeptic Zone would be greatly appreciated. Uh, and a big thanks to those people who have recurring payments via Patreon or PayPal. It means the show can keep going and be in your ears or in your car. I listen to podcasts when I'm doing very long walks, in fact, to keep my exercise going because the gyms are all shut. And uh, I've been enjoying many episodes of uh, Squaring the Strange and the uh, Skeptics with a K, and Skeptoid, the ESP, and in fact, a very wonderful person actually bought me the audio book of The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. 
So I'm having an enormous amount of pleasure rereading that, so to speak. So to speak. I find I absorb information better when I hear it as opposed to reading it. And it's just reminded me what a uh, what a wonderful book it is, and I would recommend that for any skeptic. It belongs on your shelf, in your bookshelf, alongside Flim Flam and The Demon Haunted World. It's a, a terrific book. Coming up on next week's show, we speak to an old friend of mine, Loretta Marin, known as the Jelly Bean Lady. She's going to be talking about biofeedback machines, bioresonance, these zapping machines that still plague Australian society. Did somebody say Easter egg? Hmm, we'll have to find out. But for this week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts, and to access the back catalogue of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, visit our Facebook page, or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support the Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on the Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics or any other skeptical organization. record <laughs> it's, always, it's always a good idea to press record my goodness me look at who has appeared on my screen out of nowhere it's the well-known skeptic himself rob palmer hello rob hello richard i'm glad to be here now why i've got you why i've got you you're going to be my guinea pig and then we're going to talk about something else i think you're going to be my guinea pig for this week's diet test dice test Dice, Very dice cool. and nice. I've been listening to this for years, and I always <laughs> get it right every time. It's amazing. Wow, wow, wow! I'm, I'm, I'm shocked to hear that. Let's see if you can keep up your 100 percent success rate. I have a 10 sided die, and I, in fact, you know what? I can hold that up to the camera for you. Look at that. There you go. You can verify can I, for oh, the. Oh, it's list- not the one with the aliens on it. I'm I can, I about. can use that. Hang on, let me find that one. Uh, here we go. In my little box look at that oh that is so cool and where did you get that i got that at uh albuquerque airport oh so that's pretty close to roswell Very yeah cool. so you can see there's the alien face we've got Wait, is that a two the eyes are a two? no it's two. one that's a one that's okay. a one two is if i can find there i know it's three I'm, I'm doing this backwards in a camera. It's really oh, there we are. Two is two. Oh, little, two, two UFOs. Two okay. UFOs, and um, three is a UFO and two alien eyes. <laughs> four is four alien eyes. Five is four eyes and one UFO, and six are six alien eyes. So we'll there. roll it three times, and before it lands, what is your first psychic prediction or dumb luck guess for roll number one? Four. four. For sure four. For sure four. All right. That's incredible because it came up as a one. <laughs> you know, I mean. I, I can't believe the first time I'm doing this live and I get it wrong. Well, I'm sure I'll get the next two right. <laughs> right. What's your next uh, next uh, prediction? Also four. I'm pretty sure Ooh. I just was seeing that into the future with a little pre You might be right. Ooh, well, you know, all I can say is you're getting closer because it's a three. Oh, see, all right. It's a three. You are it's getting closer. Three. You are getting closer. Well, maybe I would think very far into the future. Mm-hmm. I will definitely stick with the four. All right. Here we go. Last time. Huh. That's interesting. It's, it. it's trying for you. But again, <laughs> we've landed on number three. So today's mystical I, I cannot believe the first time I've never gotten them all right. Not even one right in its life. <laughs> That's what they call the um, skeptic effect. You see, when you do a psychic experiment with a, se- uh, a septic, a skeptic, your psychic powers disappear. T- today's winning numbers, this week's winning numbers are one, three, and three. While I've got you there, Rob, you took part in something with um, our friend Susan Gerbeck online. You gave a, a talk or a lecture. Yes, she has started her about time. Um, 
project, and I was the guinea pig, so I did the first presentation as a Zoom presentation. Mm -hmm. It was about what's the harm in believing in psychics. It's a basically an expanded version of what I did at PsyCon last year. And uh, it was about 30, 35 minutes long, and then we had a nice Q&A. We did it on Zoom, and she has uploaded it to YouTube. Wow, and how can people discover that or, or look for that? Well, I made a tiny URL to make it easy. I don't have to give you the entire long string. So mm -hmm. it's tinyurl.com slash abouttime002. That's easy to remember. Tiny URL. And then uh, the the important part is about time about zero. About time zero zero two. Zero zero two. I'll we'll add a link in this week's show notes, folks. Regardless. Thank you. And uh, go and have a look. And I soon, I hope, maybe in the next couple of weeks, I'll be giving a talk uh, on that same uh, platform myself, hosted by. Oh, Susan. fantastic! Mick West just went today, and his will be uploaded shortly. And they had a nice chat all about conspiracy theories, including, of course. Uh, the coronavirus stuff that's going on right now. Excellent. It probably happened in the middle of the night my time, but I'll certainly swing by and have a look. Rob Palmer, I'll be the, looking forward to it. Rob Palmer, the well-known skeptic, thanks for dropping by. Bye-bye.